If we look at the evolution of machine safety over time, um, you know, if we start in the 1960s, um, you know, the technology was hardwired relays. They were installed, you know, where a specific need was recognized. So if there had been an accident in the past or there was um, an event that someone working on the, you know, system knew about, they may have put in a specific hardwired relay to, um, you know, stop a, a system if, if an e-stop was hit or if someone, you know, needed to, to stop it in an emergency. Um, but really in the United States, there were no regulations for machine safety. And in other parts of the world, there were some limited guidelines, but for the most part, um, it was not strictly controlled or regulated yet. As we move forward into the 1970s, um, in the United States, um, we had our, our first machine safety risk assessment requirements um, from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA. Um, and again, I'll say that Europe has tend to be a little bit ahead of um, the US when it's come to a lot of these machine safety standards. Um, so some of them started to develop and, and gain traction a little bit earlier. Um, we finally started to see more of a formal hazard analysis start as a way to identify where the um, you know, safety functions were required. Um, in terms of the, the technology that was used, um, in addition to hardwired relays, solid state logic and other things started to be implemented um, and installed. And one of the things that people expected to see in the 1970s was because you know solid state devices were believed to be more reliable, um, surely if we use those solid state relays to shut down systems um, instead of hardwired relays, then we were going to have a, a better solution that was going to be safer, more reliable. Um, but what people found was there, there really wasn't a reduction in the amount of accidents because um, when a hardwire relay fails, it, it tends to fail safe. So it may have a higher overall failure rate, but um, most often it'll de-energize the system and you know prevent the dangerous state from occurring. Whereas a solid state relay has a, um, a higher portion of failure rates that wouldn't be de-energized. And so you may actually see a, a greater percentage of those be dangerous failures. So again, so we, we still, you know, the technology was changing, but we didn't necessarily um, understand and know what would be the best way to apply it to safety functions. Um, and something that we'll look at is a lot of the machine safety standards, um, I don't want to say lagged behind some of the process safety standards, but I'll say they were more cautious of new technologies. And so we'll see um, the NFPA 79 standard, which was used um, heavily in the United States, had explicit requirements that safety functions had to be hardwired um, that they kept for um, an extended period of time. Um, if we fast forward to the 80s, now programmable logic controllers start to replace solid state and relay based systems. And from a functionality standpoint, from a flexibility, you know, there was a lot there. There was a lot of benefits for these PLCs, but we didn't have any requirements for safe software. Um, so it was actually that coding or that systematic piece that um, could be the failure and we didn't have a formal way of measuring it. So we still were not showing that we're safer. Um, and at this point, studies continued to show no decrease in accidents, um, continued financial and personal loss is, were occurring. So we're still you know, not getting to our goals. And um, even as we develop some more formal risk analysis procedures, um, and I know even in the 80s, um, again, hardwire relays are, are still being required by certain safety standards. Um, if we look at the 1990s, now we start to get what we would call safety PLCs, guidelines for um, developing safe subsets of software, um, having specific standards for designing the PLCs, more quantitative risk analysis starts to be developed, um, a more systematic approach for risk identification. Um, and now some of the machine safety standards um, include requirements for PLCs um, and their use. So a lot of the European standards started to um, adopt and include this first for if you were going to use a safety PLC for machine safety, what requirements did you have to meet? Um, but in the US, um, it was still 
you know, forced to use hardwire relays. If we look at some of the, you know, core development, um, so Europe really had, I'll say, the, the earlier standards. So DIN 31000 starting um, in the 70s was used for a, a number of years. Um, as we got to the 90s, some additional standards started to be rolled out. Um, and then if we think about, you know, what are the um, modern machine safety standards that are widely looked at, um, they're an evolution of EN 954-1, um, which ultimately was superseded by ISO 13849 and IEC 62061. Um, and in that time, we've had a number of other functional safety standards that we'll talk about um, with 61508 as the parent standard, um, 61511 for process and 62061 for machinery. Um, and then as we extend extend this timeline out, um, you know, 62061 had a new release in 2020 and ISO 13849 um, had the latest release in 2015 for part one, um, but it, that is going through updates and should um, relatively soon be released as a new version. So these are continuing um, to go forward as the primary documents that are looked at for machine safety, um, for, for the functional safety and machinery, I should say. Now, if you look at the 2000s, now we're, we're really starting to get more of our modern uh, traditional machine safety um, certified equipment. We've got certified sensors, safety relays, safety PLCs, um, actuators. Um, we're starting to get safety contactors and, and different things like that that have been formally reviewed and certified. Um, as we talked about 62061 and ISO 13849 come in, we're getting better diagnostics. We're seeing an overall safety lifecycle process. So we're starting to, to finally make some improvements and get some traction. Um, and now for the first time in 2002, um, the NFPA 79 standard does allow for safety PLCs to be used if specific requirements are met. So we start to finally get into um, I'll say more of the modern day approach where safety PLCs are, are much more commonly used and adopted. And as we fast forward to today, um, more and more equipment is becoming safety certified. We're, we're getting more options, getting more information um, to, to have choices when building uh, safety functions for machinery applications, uh, more safety rated PLCs, more safety rated relays, um, as well as you know, the sensors and inputs and the, the outputs themselves. So we're continuing to see that evolution. Based on some of this information, does anyone have any estimates on, you know, what they think the you know industry failure rates would show um, and, and any trends? You know, do we think that over time machinery applications have gotten safer, have improved? Um, do we think that things have been stagnant? You know, does anyone have any thoughts there? I think that's a key piece, right? People are, you know, starting to buy in more, starting to understand the standards more. Um, and, and that's exactly what, what you would expect, right? Uh, we'd want to see, you know, some strong improvement. Um, but the truth is, um, now these um, data sets are, are based on the, the U.S., um, I, I looked at a couple of other studies and I think that they're relatively representative. I know that there will be, you know, differences between regions, um, but ultimately what we've seen is as technology has advanced, we've seen improvements from, you know, where things started in the 1970s. Um, and apologize with the formatting, it's a little bit cut off. But so this top one here, um, we'll call it the medium gray, is our, our mining, um, which started out being um, very risky. Um, and over time, you know, we've seen some significant drops. Um, we've seen, you know, improvements in construction. Uh, let me see. I'll, I'll have to confirm which one is red. Um, I'm pretty sure orange is transportation. 
Um, and then our all industries average is, is kind of, let's say, our key metric in, in black, which sums all of these different ones together um, and, and really gives us our overall industry trend. And what we see um, is that for the 1970s until the mid 1990s, we've got pretty significant reduction in um, you know, a lot of the higher risk industries. And so overall we saw good reduction, but if we go from you know, the 2000s to now, there's a, a slight downward trend, but it's actually much flatter than we might expect. Um, and so if we look at that, um, the overall machine safety improvements have been relatively flat since the early 2000s. So if we just pull out data points from 2000, 2010, and 2018, which was um, the, the latest one that there was full data of when we pulled this together, um, we, we really see that there's not that much of a difference. You know, certainly overall, um, the industries of manufacturing are, are slightly safer than they were in 2000, but we're not seeing, you know, massive drops between, um, you know, the years as, as time goes on. Um, some of the myths that we see about machine safety are where I personally believe, you know, a lot of these accidents continue to happen um, and why we're not getting a, as safe as we could be. Um, and these are things that, you know, as you read it, are, are primarily things that the, the asked owners would be saying. Um, but I think it's, it's something that we do need to be aware of when it comes to machine safety. So things like machine safety was handled by the equipment designer. There's nothing I have to do as an operator, right? Someone did a risk assessment, they put in a safety function. I can just, you know, go about my day and, you know, there's no risk to me. Or um, something I hear a lot is, you know, I'm walking around a facility and they've got spinning blades, they've got pinch points that are out and exposed. And I'll say, hey, you know, what's the, the guarding philosophy for that? Or, or how do we make sure people stay away? And they say, oh, everyone knows that's not safe. They wouldn't go near it. Um, and they, you know, go under that assumption until, you know, for whatever reason, that day is slightly different. They're trying to, you know, make an adjustment or they drop something and they, you know, go too close. Now all of a sudden, because it's not guarded, it's not safe. Um, or, or the belief that um, machine safety issues are something for developing nations. You know, we can see in the United States, um, really, again, they're, they're not making the improvements. Um, things like, you know, there was training done once, um, you don't need a refresher on it, um, or things like, you know, we've not had any issues before, so we must be safe. Um, and, and I think one of the, the things that we really wanna make sure that we cover is in addition to all of the, the technical aspects for designing the system, if we don't address the human element, if we don't address the, um, the management aspects of it, both for the policies and procedures and the approach that the you know, final um, asset owner uses, um, or if we don't address the potential for systematic failures um, due to human errors when designing the safety functions, we really haven't done our job of making the machine safe. Um, and so that's something that um, is maybe a little bit of a mindset shift, um, but this is something that we see as, as really important because ultimately what we wanna make sure that we do is, is that we make the industry safer and we, we need to think about what are all of the things that need to happen for that to be the case. Okay. And so, you know, if we if we start with, let's say the, the myths and, and our picture of the, the Pegasus and, and fast forward, flash forward to the reality, um, you know, we continue to see many accidents and many fatalities. So in 2017, uh, there were over 36,000 injuries related to machinery um, in the United States. Uh, there were 6,200 non-fatal amputations, nearly 60% involving machinery, and there were nearly 3,000 fatalities in 2019. And I think something that often gets missed or, or, or has a tendency to, to maybe get missed when it comes to machine safety is because there aren't the, um, you know, the multiple fatality explosions or the major news events um, like there are with the process industry, a, a lot of times, you know, we may think that machinery is a little bit safer than it is because it just doesn't get talked about as much. There's not the same 
um, let's say media coverage on it and so we just tend to be a little bit less aware um, but the truth is that there are still um, a, a very high number of fatalities and a very high number of um, injuries that are still occurring today um, and, and that's you know really something that we need to, to to focus on and so when we think about machine safety and why it's important um, you know machining environments are hazardous right there are many known types of hazards that exist in those environments we've got mechanical hazards like cutting and crushing uh, we've got electrical hazards um, for shock uh, we can have um, hazardous emissions um, heat uh, you know chemical specific impacts so there are lots of different hazards that are there that we know about um, we continue to see machinery related incidents lead to fatalities and serious injuries and what's currently done, um, and, and it's really the, the practices, right? We talked about the technology is getting better. There have been lots of improvements there, but the practices and what the, um, you know, the final organizations that are operating these machines are doing continues to expose individuals to high levels of safety, financial, and legal risk. And so we need to leverage those technology improvements, but it, it's not just those that are going to let us achieve our risk targets. And so because of that, we need a holistic life cycle driven approach um, and we need to manage both the people and the technology. And by putting those two halves together, then we can really move the industry forward um, and look to um, achieve our specific goals um, and make sure that we are, again, lowering the numbers of fatalities and, and the numbers of um, serious incidents.